Section 4 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Schnell. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 9 Mecca, Jada, Sawakin, Hali, Saraja, Sabid, Khasana, Jabala, Kias, Sana, Aden, Zaila, Magdashu, Mombasa, Kalwa, Safar, Hadramaut, Amman, El Ahaf, Fruits, etc., El Hasik, the island of Tair, Kolhat, Amman, Naswa. At this time, that is, in the year 729, A.D. 1328, prayer was made during the sermon for the king of Iraq, Abu Zaid, and after that for El Malik El Nasir. I remained there during the third year also, and then left Mecca with the intention of visiting Yemen. I arrived accordingly at Jeddah. From this place I went with a company of merchants who were going to Yemen, but as the wind changed upon us, we put into the island of Sawakin, the sultan of which was al-Sharif Said ibn Abu Noma, son of the emir of Mecca. Sawakin fell to him on the part of the Beja, who were nearly related to him, and from whom he had an army attending upon him. From Sawakin I set out for Yemen with the merchants and came to Hali, a large and handsomely built city. The inhabitants are aboriginal Arabs governed by the sultan Amir ibn Duwaib of the tribe Beni Kanana. He is one of the most elegant, generous, and poetical geniuses of his time. He took me with him and entertained me very hospitably for some days. From this place I traveled with the merchants to the town of Sarja, a small place inhabited by merchants of Yemen, a liberal and hospitable people. From this place I went to the city of Sabid, where I arrived in two days. This is one of the primary cities of Yemen. It is large and handsome and abounding with every commodity. The inhabitants are generous, well-informed and religious. In its environs, the village of Ghassana is the grave of Al-Wali al-Sali Ahmed ibn al-Ujjayl al-Yemeni. The doctors of Sabit told me of one of his miracles, which was this. The doctors and great people of the Saidiya sect once came to his cell. The sheikhs sat without the cell and received and returned their salutations. At length, a question arose on the subject of predestination. The Saidiya affirming that there was no such thing and that every man was the author of his own actions. The sheikh replied, if the matter be as you say it is, get up from the place where you are now sitting. They all endeavored to rise, but not one of them could do so. The sheikh left them in the situation and went into his cell. They accordingly remained in the state, subject to the burning rays of the sun and lamenting their sad condition, till after sunset, when some of the sheikh's companions going in to him told him that the people had repented and turned from their corrupt creed. He then came out to them, and taking them by the hand, joined them in their conversion to the truth and dereliction of error. They arose and entered the cell, where he hospitably entertained them and sent them home. I went to the village in order to visit the grave of the sheikh, which I did, and met his son, al Kashia Ismail, who entertained me very hospitably. I then went to Jabala, which is a small town, and from there to the city of Tias, the residence of the king of Yemen. This is one of the most beautiful and extensive cities of Yemen. The sultan of this place was al-Malik al-Muhajid Nur Odin Ali, son of the sultan al-Mawayi Daud, son of Rasul, sent or commissioned. The grandfather of these sultans was called Rasul because one of the caliphs of the house of Abbas had sent or commissioned him as the emir of Yemen after which his descendants kept possession of this government. I was introduced to the king with the kazi of the place. Their custom in saluting their king is this. Any person coming before him first places his forefinger on the ground and then 
putting it on his head, says, May God perpetuate thy power. I was received very courteously and then invited to a banquet. After this I travel to the city of Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. It is a large and well-built city. From this place I went to the city of Aden, which is situated on the seashore. This is a large city, but without either seed, water or tree. They have, however, reservoirs in which they collect the rainwater for drinking. Some rich merchants reside here, and vessels from India occasionally arrive here. The inhabitants are modest and religious. I then went from Aden by sea, and after four days came to the city of Zaila. This is a city of the Berbers, a people of the Sudan of the Shafia sect. Their country is a desert of two months' extent. The first part is termed Zaila, the last Magdashu. The greatest part of the inhabitants of Zaila, however, are of the Rafisa sect. Their food is, for the most part, camel's flesh and fish. The stench of the country is extreme, as is also its filth from the stink of the fish and the blood of camels which are slaughtered in its streets. I then proceeded by sea for fifteen days and came to Magdashu, which is an exceedingly large city. The custom here is that, whenever any ships approach, the young men of the city come out and each one addressing himself to a merchant becomes his host. If there be a theologian or a noble on board, he takes up his residence with the Kazi. When it was heard that I was there, the Kazi came with his students to the beach, and I took up my abode with him. He then took me to the Sultan, whom they style Sheikh. The custom is that a noble or a theologian must be presented to the Sultan before he takes up his abode in the city. When, therefore, the Kazi came to the palace, one of the king's servants met him. The Kazi was then Borhan Odin el-Misri of Egypt, and to him he mentioned my having come. The servant then went to the Sultan and informed him, but soon returned to us with a basket of vegetables and some for walnuts. These he divided among us and then presented us with rose water, which is the greatest honor done among them to any one. He then said, It is the command of the king that this person should reside in the student's house. The Kazi then took me by the hand and conducted me to it. It was near the palace, was spread with carpets and prepared for a feast. The servants then brought meats from the palace. Their meat is generally rice, roasted with oil and placed in a large wooden dish. Over this they place a large dish of il kushan, which consists of flesh, fish, fowl and vegetables. They also roast the fruit of the plantain and afterwards boil it in new milk. They then put it on a dish and the curdled milk on another. They also put on dishes some of preserved lemon, bunches of preserved pepper pods salted and pickled, as also grapes, which are not unlike apples, except that they have stones. These, when boiled, become sweet like fruit in general, but are crude before this. They are preserved by being salted and pickled. In the same manner, they use the green ginger. When therefore they eat the rice, they eat after it these salts and pickles. The people of Magdashu are very corpulent. They are enormous eaters, one of them eating as much as a congregation ought to do. The Sultan then sent for me and for each of my companions a dress, after which I was presented to him. The custom in giving a salute is the same as with that among the kings of Yemen. I remained some days the king's guest and then set out for the country of the Sanuj, proceeding along the seashore. I then went on board a vessel and sailed to the island of Mombasa, which is large, abounding with the banana, the lemon and the citron. They also have a fruit which they call the jamun, jambu. It is like the olive with a stone, except that this fruit is exceedingly sweet. There is no grain on this island. What they have is brought to them from other places. The people are generally religious, chaste and honest, and are of the sect of Shafia. After lodging there one night, I set out by sea for the city of Kulwa, which is large and consists of wooden houses. The greater part of the inhabitants are Sanuji, of the sect of Shafia, of religious and peaceful habits. The king of this place, at the time I entered it, was Abu el-Musafir Hassan.
person who had obtained great victories, they seldom give gold. I then proceeded to the city of Safar by sea. This is the farthest city of Yemen and situated on the shore of the Indian Sea. From this place they carry horses to India, and when the wind is fair they pass from it to the Indian shores in a full month. Between Safar and Aden by land is the distance of a month, but between it and Hadramaut that of sixteen days, and between it and Amman twenty days. This city of Safar stands alone in a large plain, in which there is no other village or governed district. It is a filthy place and full of flies on account of the great quantity of fish and dates which are sold there. They feed their beasts and flocks also with fish, a custom witnessed by me nowhere else. Their money is made of copper and tin. They bath several times in the day on account of the heat of their country. Their diseases are generally the elephantiasis and hernia. The greatest wonder among them is that they injure no one unless he have previously injured them. Many kings have attempted their country but have been forced to return with the effects of their devices upon their own necks. At the distance of half a day from this place is the city of El Ahav, the residence of the people of Ad. In this city there are many gardens in which there is the large and sweet fruit of the banana, the seed of one of which will weigh ten ounces. There is also the betel tree and that of the coconut, which are generally found nowhere else except in India, and to those of India may these be compared. I shall now describe both. With respect to the betel leaf, its tree is supported just as that of unripe grapes generally is. They prop it up with reeds. It is planted near the coconut and is sometimes supported by it. The betel tree produces no fruit, but is reared merely for its leaf, which is like the leaf of the thorn, and the smallest are the best. These leaves are plucked daily. The people of India esteem it very highly, for whenever any one of them receives a visit from another, the present made is five of these leaves, which is thought to be very splendid, particularly if the donor happened to be one of the nobles. This gift is esteemed among them as being much more valuable than that of gold or silver. Its use is as follows. A grain of farewell, which is in some respects like a nutmeg, is first taken and broken into small pieces. It is then put into the mouth and chewed. A leaf of the betel is then taken and when sprinkled with a little quicklime is put into the mouth and chewed with the farewell. Its properties are to sweeten the breath, help the digestion and to obviate the danger incident to drinking water on an empty stomach. It also elevates the spirits and stimulates to venery. As to the coconut, it is the same with the Indian nut. The tree is very rare and valuable. It is something like the palm. The nut is like a man's head, for it has something like two eyes and a mouth, and within, when green, is like the brains. Upon it too is a fiber like hair. From this they make cords with which they sew their vessels together instead of iron nails. They also make great ropes for their anchors out of it. The properties of this nut are to nourish and quickly fatten the body, to make the face red and greatly to stimulate to venery. Milk, oil, olive and honey are also made out of it. They make the honey thus, having cut off the tendril on which the fruit would be formed, leaving it however about the length of two fingers, they then suspend a larger or smaller pot to it and into this a kind of water drops, which they collect morning and evening. They then expose it to the fire, just as they do dried grapes, and it becomes stiff and exceedingly sweet honey. Out of this they make sweet meats. As to the making of milk, they open the side of the nut, take out the whole of the inside with a knife, and put it on a plate. This they macrate well in water. It then becomes milk, both as to taste and color, and is eaten as such. The oil olive is thus made. When the nut is ripe and has fallen from the tree, they peel off the bark and cut it into pieces. It is then placed in the sun, and when it is withered, they heat it in a pot, and having extracted its oil, eat it with their breakfast and other meals. 
The Sultan of Safar is Al-Malik al mogid uncle's son to the King of Yemen. Leaving Safar, I proceeded by sea towards Amman, and on the second day put into the port of Hasig, where many Arab fishermen reside. We have here the incense tree. This tree has a thin leaf, which when scarified produces a fluid like milk. This turns into gum, and is then called loban, or frankincense. The houses are built with the bones of fish, and are covered with the skins of camels. Leaving this place, we arrived in four days at the mountain of Loma'an, which stands in the middle of the sea. On the top of it is a strong edifice of stone, and on the outside of this there is a reservoir for the rainwater. After two days I arrived at the island of Tair, in which there is not a house. It abounds with such birds as the sparrow. After this I came to a large island in which the inhabitants have nothing to eat but fish. I then arrived at the city of Kulhat, which is situated on the top of a mountain. The inhabitants are Arabs, whose language is far from elegant and who are, for the most part, schismatics. This, however, they keep secret, because they are subject to the king of Hormuz, who is of the Sunni sect. I then set out for the country of Amman, and after six days' journey through a desert arrived there on the seventh. It abounds with trees, rivers, gardens, with palms and various fruit trees. I entered one of the principal cities of these parts, which is Nazwa. This is situated on a hill and abounds with gardens and water. The inhabitants are schismatics of the Ibazia sect. They fall in with the opinions of the base Ibn Moljam and say that he is the saint who shall put an end to error. They also allow the caliphates of Abu Bakr and Omar but deny those of Otman and Ali. Their wives are most base, yet, without denying this, they express nothing like jealousy on the subject. The Sultan of Amman is an Arab of the tribe of El Azd, named Abu Muhammad ibn Naban, but Abu Muhammad is with them a general title, given to any ruler, just as Atabek and other titles are to sultans of other places. The inhabitants eat the flesh of the domestic ass, which is sold in the streets, and which they say is lawful. Chapter 10 Hormuz, Harauna, Janjabal, Kuzistan, Lar, Kaisa or Siraf, Fars, Pearl Fisheries, Kozair or Hoair, El Kotaif, Hajar or Haza, Yemama, Rasdawair, Aidab, Egypt, Cairo, Syria, El Ramla, Tripoli, Jabala, Ladikia, Kum, El Alaya. From this place I went to Hormuz, which is a city built on the seashore, opposite to which, but within the sea, is New Hormuz. This is an island, the city of which is called Hansists of Salt Earth and of Hills of Darani Salt. The inhabitants subsist upon fish and dates, the latter of which is brought from Basra or Amman. They have but little water. The most strange thing I saw here was the head of a fish which might be compared to a hill. Its eyes were like two doors, so that people could go in at the one and out at the other. The Sultan of Hormuz was at this time Kotb Odin Tamatas, son of Turan Shah, a most generous and brave prince. Under his control were the pearl fisheries. From Harauna I proceeded to Jandabal for the purpose of visiting a certain saint. I accordingly crossed the sea and then hired some Turkomans who inhabit these parts and without whose assistance there is no traveling on account of their courage and knowledge of the roads. We have now a waterless desert, four days in extent, over which the Badawin Arab caravans travel. In this, the Somum blows during the months of June and July, and kills everyone it meets with, after which his limbs drop off. Over this I traveled and arrived at the country of Kauristan, Kuzistan, which is small. 
From this place I proceeded for three days over a desert like the former, till I came to Lar, which is a large and beautiful city, abounding with rainwater and gardens. I now went to the cell of the holy Sheikh Abu Dolaf, the person whom I intended to visit at Janjabal. In this cell was his son, Abdel Rahman, with a number of fakirs. In the same place resides a sultan whom they call Jalal Odin el Turkomani. I next went to the city of Janjabal, in which the Sheikh Abu Dolaf resided. I went to his cell and found him alone sitting on the side of it upon the ground and clothed in an old woolen garment. I saluted him, he returned the salute, and then asked me about my coming thither and of my country. He afterwards made me stay with him, and by one of his sons, who is a pious, humble, abstemious, and very good man, he sent me meat and fruits. This sheik is an astonishing man. He has a very large cell, and bestows costly presents, and moreover clothes and feeds all who visit him. I saw no one like him in these parts, nor is it known whence his income is derived, unless it is brought to him by the brotherhood. Most people, however, think that it is from miraculous operations. The people of these parts are of the sect of Shafia. I then bade farewell to the sheikh and traveled on to the city of Kaisa, which is also called Siraf. It is situated on the shore of the Indian Ocean and near to the Sea of Yemen. Fars is a good and extensive district. Its gardens are wonderfully rich in scented herbs. The inhabitants are Persians. Those, however, who dive for the pearls are Arabs. The pearl fisheries, which are between Siraf and Bahrain, are situated in a quiet gulf of the sea, not unlike a large valley. To this place comes a great number of boats, and in these are the divers with the merchants of Fars and Bahrain. When one of the divers intends to go down, he places something upon his face made out of tortoise shell, and in this a place for the nose is cut out. He then ties a rope round his middle and goes down. The time they will remain under water varies. Some will remain an hour, others two, others less. When the diver gets to the bottom of the sea, he finds the shells firmly fixed in the sand among trees of coral. He then either tears them off with his hands, or cuts them away with an iron knife and puts them into a leathern bag which hangs to his neck. When he begins to experience a difficulty of remaining under water, he shakes the rope and the man who holds it draws him up and puts him into the boat. The bag is then taken and the shells opened and they find in each a piece of flesh, which being cut away with a knife and exposed to air hardens and becomes a pearl. After this, both great and small are collected together, and one-fifth goes to the king. The rest are sold to the merchants present. To many of these merchants, however, the divers are generally in debt, and in this case the pearls are taken by way of payment. I next proceeded from Siraf to the city of Bahrain, which is a large and handsome place, abounding in gardens and water. It is wonderfully hot, and so very sandy that the houses will sometimes be overwhelmed with sand. There is at both the eastern and western side of it a hill or bank, the one they call Kosair, the other Hoair, and on these they have an adage and say, Kosair and Hoair, and indeed every opponent brings advantage. I then travelled to the city of Kotaif, as if it were a word of the diminutive form of Kotf. It is, however, a large and handsome place, inhabited by Arabs of the Rafisa sect, extremely enthusiastic, publishing their sentiments and fearing no one. From this place I proceeded to the city of Hajar, which, however, is now called El Hassa. We have here a greater abundance of dates than is to be found elsewhere, and which are used as fodder for the beasts. The inhabitants are Arabs of the tribe of Abd al -Qais. From this place I traveled to Yamama, which is also called Hajr, a beautiful and fertile city, abounding with water and gardens. The inhabitants are, for the most part, of the tribe Beni Hanifa. They are the ancient possessors of this district. From this place I went on pilgrimage and arrived at Mecca in the year 733 of the Hejra, A.D. 1332. In this year, the Sultan of Egypt, El Malik El Nasir, also performed the pilgrimage. After finishing the pilgrimage, I proceeded towards Jeddah, intending to go by way of Yemen to India. 
but in this I failed. I then proceeded by sea towards Aydab, but was driven by the wind into the port called Rastawai. From this place I traveled by land with the Beja, and passed over a desert in which there was a great number of ostriches and gazelles, and some Badawin Arabs subject to the Beja. After a journey of nine days, I arrived at Aida, and leaving this place and passing through district after district in Upper Egypt, arrived at last at Cairo, where I remained some days. Hence I proceeded to Syria and then to Jerusalem. From this place I went to El Ramla, Akka, Tripoli, Jabala, and El Larikia, Laodicea, and from this I went by sea to the country of Rum, which has been so called because it formerly belonged to the Romans and even now they are here in considerable numbers under the protection of the Mohammedans. Here are also many Turkomans. I next arrived at El Alaya, which is a large city upon the seashore, inhabited by Turkomans. The present sultan is Yusuf Beg, son of Karman. I was introduced to him. Our meeting was pleasant, and he furnished us with provisions. End of section 4. Recording by Ernst Schnell.